episode 88 of the Pilot the Pilot podcast takes off now. My name is Bailey Scheel, and I am the Autoland project manager. I help get the software, hardware, um, engineers, the uh, airplanes, all of that together at the right time to make Autoland happen with certification. What is going on, Aviation Nation? And welcome back to episode 88 of the Pilot the Pilot podcast. Today's podcast is an exciting one. I had the ability to speak with Garmin and talk about their new Autoland technology. A few months ago, Garmin announced Autoland and it does exactly as it's prescribed to do. It will automatically land the plane if the pilot becomes incapacitated and can no longer land. I was able to talk with Bailey, who is one of the key engineers for this project, and she kind of did everything. She was there from the beginning, and she was there for the tough times, and she was also there to see it succeed and get to where it is today. We pretty much talk anything and everything, and I just ask every question I can possibly think of. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. I hope you get a lot out of it, and I hope you can kind of get an insight to what possibly might might be the future of a general aviation and aviation as a whole. Aviation, if you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash pilot the pilot. You can also check us out on our website, pilot the pilot hq.com. You can find all the links there to leave a review, listen on iTunes, Spotify, and Patreon and our Instagram and Twitter. So go ahead and check those out. And Aviation, I don't want to keep you much longer. So without any further ado, here's Bailey from Garmin. Bailey, what is going on? Welcome to the Pilot the Pilot podcast. Thank you for having me. No problem. I'm excited to have you on. I mean, things have to be pretty exciting over there with you guys. Yeah, it's been a pretty crazy couple of years, really. I bet. And I don't know if people really understand like how long this has taken to come to fruition. Um, How long has it taken? Take in, I guess you'd say. <laughs> yeah, Garmin started our software development in 2011, but it was on our product roadmap for a while before that as well. Uh, we had our first uh, first flight in 2014 and our first fully autonomous landing February 17th, 2016. So that's one of my favorite aviation history dates. And now that I can actually talk about it, I want to <laughs> recognize that it <laughs> happened years ago. Absolutely. Well, before we get kind of into Autoland and Garmin, I want to kind of get to know you a little bit more as well. Um, when When did you realize that you wanted to have a career in aviation? I grew up flying with my grandfather quite a bit, and I really enjoyed the the culture the you know the kind of the lifestyle of um having a lot of piloting friends and that sort of thing um but i realized i didn't sit still very well so i <laughs> had to fly and I, my grandfather was an airline pilot and i just I, I don't think i could sit still that long um and my other grandfather actually was a engineer and so between the two i wanted to get into engineering of aircraft um I went to school for mechanical engineering and then ended up here at Garmin uh, working on avi- uh, aviation equipment. Cool. What school did you go to? Uh, I went to Utah State. Oh, nice. That's a, I don't know. I didn't know this growing up because I'm from the East Coast, but Utah State's a fairly big aviation school, isn't it? It is. So we have um, an aviation program there. There's also a really big aerospace engineering program, which is what I, uh, I was focused on. What made you choose Utah State? Just Was it the, kind of the only school in the, the area that offered what you wanted? Or was it kind of always like, I want to go to Utah State. Utah State's where it's at. I actually kind of scholarships based. I, I wanted to go to a really good aerospace engineering school. And, um, and Utah State offered a really great out-of-state program for um, students to come from uh, surrounding states. So that's a deciding factor. Money really talks, doesn't it? It really does. <laughs> yeah. Um, a little bit. What is so obviously we kind of talk about or the media and everyone talks about how there aren't very many women in aviation. I think pilot wise, it's seven percent. and I'm guessing engineer wise, it's either around that, maybe even less. What would you say your experiences have been as being a woman in aviation or a woman in engineering? And would you say that it's getting better? Are there more women getting in or would you say it's staying about the same? Um, I can't really speak too broadly since I only have my own personal experience, but um, I see, you know, there are very few women around. That's, uh, that's kind of a fair statement. We are obviously trying to build that and Garmin's honestly really dedicated to help get more women into aviation and engineering. So that's really cool to see. Um, I must say my, my team has doubled recently from one to two. So very exciting. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, thanks. Um, but it's, uh, it's definitely a challenge. There are times where you just have to go find someone that, you know, is a, an ally and, you know, chat about things and, um, that really helps. Yeah, 
for sure. And uh, it's definitely something that I think we need to to solve and get more women in aviation, whether it's flying, or whether it's being an engineer, or whether it's just anything in aviation. So I think that's awesome. Yeah. What uh, you we talked a little bit before, and you are a pilot too, right? Did you get your rating at Utah State, or did you do it separate? Uh, I actually did that in high school. So I got my um, single engine land in high school. Um, actually, before I learned how to drive a car, uh, but. I lived, uh, I grew up in Oregon and I uh, lived quite close to the um, Evergreen Aviation Museum, which is now the Evergreen Air and Space Museum, I believe. Um, and they actually paid for uh, half of my flight costs. So that was really awesome. That helped get me into aviation just from an educational perspective. Absolutely. And uh, when you started the flying, were you kind of, and I know you said that you couldn't sit still, you didn't like to sit still. Was it pretty evident when you started flying or did you kind of think for a little bit, maybe I should be a professional pilot? I considered it. I really did. Um, I, it's just after a long cross country, I'm, I look forward to like, you know, sprinting around the, the ramp instead of sitting in your plane. So um, I figured a, a desk job where I don't have to pretend to be stationary all day is probably better. Yeah. If you have a feeling of being claustrophobic, not necessarily claustrophobic, but if you don't, if you want, want if you well, I can't talk, if you don't want to be stuck in a plane for that long, then flying and being a pilot is definitely not for you. We have some six hour, seven hour legs where it's just like, oh my gosh, get me out of this thing. <laughs> yeah. My yeah. grandfather routinely did a flight from Chicago to Rome. Oh my gosh! That, sounds, that was his that was his day job, which is flying to Rome every day. Uh, and I mean, that'd be kind of cool. I wouldn't mind flying to Rome every day, but <laughs> being stuck <laughs> in the plane would be kind of a hot mess for that long. Perfect. Well, um, a little bit more about Auto Land. We kind of I kind of want to focus on kind of the history, when the roadmap happened, why you why it was even thought about, and and I guess one question is when we can get to it is. Um, did you expect it? Did they expect it to take this long? Like, is this like a part of the plan or did, did you have a bunch of hurdles coming up when you guys were creating this? Uh, Autoland is, I think, just like any other aviation technology. It takes time to develop correctly, to think through all the different corner cases and ensure that we're thinking through the safety aspects. Um, I think everyone would have wanted it earlier than this um, just because we always want to have things, you know, efficient and quick. Um, but there have been some really unique challenges just um, ATC has to be aware and involved and in making sure that we coordinate well with them and that they're comfortable with what the aircraft's going to be doing. Um, just, you know, things like that where we have to really think through how do you, um, how do you feel the technology until it's done to have those conversations? Yeah. What, um, well, I guess that leads to a question. How does ATC know? Does that automatically squawk an emergency? It does. So Autoland, when it's activated, it'll uh, immediately change the transponder to 7700. It begins uh, transmitting on uh, various comm frequencies, including 121.5, so the emergency frequency. Uh, so it has an automatic uh, text-to-speech uh, message that it will play uh, that's um, the aircraft, where it is, that there's a possible pilot incapacitation, and where it's heading, and the amount of time it'll take to get there. That's wild. I mean, that's just like crazy. It's 2019, and we got that stuff going on. It's wild. <laughs> that's... uh. That, that's pretty cool. I mean, I didn't know about that aspect of it too, because yeah, you think about it, emergency, say it's a single pilot, they can't make any radio calls and someone needs a squawk, someone needs to communicate. Those are two huge things to do in an emergency. And uh, you guys kind of thought of everything, which you have to think of everything because you know, it's aviation things like you could plan this whole auto land system for, for one perfect scenario. And that one scenario will never happen, you know? So you have to think of everything and it has to be pretty hard to think of everything. I'm sure that's one of the reasons why it took so long. Yeah. And one of the things that we had to think about that we've never necessarily had to think about is the passenger. It's not about the pilot. The pilot doesn't need to see anything. The pilot doesn't need to do anything. How do we make sure the passenger is calm? How do they know that the system is doing what it's supposed to be doing, that it's going somewhere that they're going to get help? And if they want to, how do they communicate? How do we teach them to, um, to communicate with emergency so that they can get whatever help that they need? What were some of the hiccups that you guys ran into and um, like specifically, like, was it just uh, the technology wasn't good enough or was it kind of airplane components? Was it you needed to get up from a G1000 to like a G3000 or like kind of just talk a little bit about pro the problems and struggles that you had when you were creating this? Uh, some of the struggles that we had, I think you, you had a couple of them. We, you know, we have to figure out how to get this uh, into the aircraft. You know, there's definitely some, um, some size and weight considerations. We want to make sure that this fits in aircraft and it's not going to be uh, taking up an entire seat, you know, of, of space. Well, what good is it if there's no passenger in the airplane, right? Exactly. If no one can fit in the airplane. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, so we had to 
make sure it was uh, light and efficient and um, really had to think through if we had to put something on the aircraft, if we would necessarily need it. Um, one of the items that we really didn't want to have to use was a radar altimeter um, because we wanted to just be able to use GPS. And what we found as we did the system and as we tested it is it would work. It was fine, but it wasn't as reliable and as um, as precise as it needed to be for uh, the flare and touchdown. So we determined that we did need a radar altimeter and Garmin has one, um, but that added, you know, a couple of pounds to the, the load of, you know, the, the weight of auto land. Um, so that was, you know, kind of a disappointment, but it also that we have the technology, we could go to something bigger. We already planned for it. It's just, you know, we had to make that call. When you had this plan was obviously, I mean, we can get more into this later, but obviously for the average Joe flying around in a Cessna 172, this really isn't possible right now. Like, obviously there's still some years to catch up and they need some STCs. I'm sure they have to, to buy better avionics. But when you guys are planning this, was this planned for all of general aviation or because, I mean, right now it's coming out with the Cirrus jet and is it the Meridian or the Piper plane, correct? Uh, Piper M600. M600, yep. okay. So obviously right now it's a very, very small market that can use this technology because I'm guessing you need to have a specific, well, like a G1000, maybe more, and you have to have auto throttles, I'm guessing, and some kind of auto braking capacity, which you won't be able to put into a 172 unless you want to spend the money for it. So kind of, I know right now it's going to be expensive, but in the future, in the game plan and kind of the roadmap, like we we're talking about earlier, is there a way to make this cheaper so everyone can use it? That's yeah, that's definitely been part of the the game plan. So the, right now it takes the G three thousand with auto throttle, um, and then we have to integrate with um, you know brakes and flaps and um, landing gear, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, as we can and as technology allows us to, we're going to, going to be putting this into as many aircraft as we can. Um, that turboprop and turbojet market really makes the most sense since they are uh, often single. Um, I guess it makes the most sense to start with um, since they are often, you know, single pilot or owner flown and uh, they get up into those higher flight levels where maybe hypoxia or, um, you know, just various medical emergencies are more likely from historical things. We see all the time that there are, you know, smaller aircraft that have issues, pilots have heart attacks, that sort of thing. And um, we want to be there to help however we can. So yeah, there's definitely some places that we need to um, improve the technology. But at the same time, if you think about a 172 compared to an M600, you know, maybe we don't need to worry about the flaps, you know, maybe we can land higher, um, higher speed and that's okay. Uh, maybe on the ground steering isn't as big of a deal. Maybe we can just use the rudder instead of uh, trying to do some differential anti-skid braking. Um, maybe even brakes. Do we need to have brakes if it's a enough airport, a small enough airplane with a long enough runway? Is that a, an option? So those are just some of the thoughts that we've been having as we look towards the smaller aircraft. I fly uh, Citation Latitude for my job, and obviously we have the Garmin 5000 in there, and it's just like how automated that airplane is is unbelievable. I'm sure it really wouldn't take that much effort or that much work to kind of get that fully incorporated inside that system. So and like you said, the the more automated, the, the higher tech the airplane is, the easier it is going to be to actually put that in there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it pretty much flies itself already. It just won't land itself. But <laughs> <laughs> apparently you guys worked on that. So <laughs> what? Um, so obviously airliners have kind of auto land, but it's a different kind of auto land. This is with the pilots flying. This is down to below minimums and shooting really, really low approaches. Do you kid this kind of segue into that for maybe corporate planes for like the bigger fractional companies and corporate companies? Or do you think this is just going to stay pilot incapacitated and can't fly? Right now, just the way the regulations are set, um, it's pilot incapacitation. It has to declare an emergency just due to some of the complexities with the system. Um, but yeah, the Cat 3 um, Autoland comparison is an interesting one since that does have the pilot in the loop. And with Autoland, with Garmin's Autoland, we have to do everything, including picking where you're going. You know, you have to pick that runway, um, you know, avoid weather, obstacles, terrain, all of that, and then get to land. So it's it's a slightly different thing. You know, if you're an airliner and you don't know which runway you're going to, I have some serious questions for your flight planning. Uh, but in an emergency, obviously that makes a bit more sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, obviously that's kind of 
possibly that's in the future as well. Cause like you said, as technology comes in and what you can do is just going to be pretty cool to see and to, to watch. And when, when this first came out, I thought this was, I didn't realize it was pilot incapacitated. I thought this mm-hmm. was auto land, like say the engine failed. And I was like, uh, how does it do that? Like, it's going to pick the best field, the farm or like what it was going to do. So the more I read and the more I watched, the more I was kind of blown away with what it can do and how many calculations it's taking into, into, just trying to remember and trying to put together all so quickly because it calculates fuel, it calculates everything and it figures out when it needs to stop, how it needs to stop the glide path and flaps and brakes. And that's just wild to think about. Yeah, it really is. I was thinking about that actually a couple of days ago um, because I was trying to compare a normal pilot having a normal emergency, let's call it to auto land and, you know, aviate, navigate, communicate if a pilot has an emergency, they aviate first and figure out how to communicate later. And with Autoland, the fact that we pick a destination, um, make a route to it, and you know we've already changed our transponder over and we're already starting to communicate on the comms in about three seconds. So just how quickly the system gets to work because it is a computer and it's not a, a pilot at that point. It's kind of interesting to make that comparison. Yeah, I actually had an emergency when I was uh, doing when I was time building. I was flying a 206 back from Washington, D.C. doing aerial survey and we lost our engine over West Virginia and kind of thinking about what you said, like aviate, navigate, communicate. We were low enough, so not so low, but we were low and we didn't have time to communicate. We just had time to aviate and navigate to like a field or a farm or wherever, like a little mountaintop where we landed. So there wasn't much time for communication. So the system can kind of all do that all at once. And I guess it's kind of a benefit of a computer over a person. Now, people also argue that maybe the person might choose a better runway or might choose a better this or, you know, because software can kind of be, can be touchy and can be glitchy sometimes. But I'm guessing that in your studies and in your preparing for this that you guys have kind of did you put in like a margin of error at all or is there a margin of error with this or is it pretty perfect every time yeah so there's there's margins in it and so um one of the main runway selection criteria is the landing distance and the um, braking distance obviously determines how long we need of a runway um and through all of our um our development flight tests which on the m600 we did uh i want to say like 200 landings We've done over about 900, actually, all told for Garmin. Um, and all of those landing distances, we, you know, we added some margin to that just in case, you know, the runway is slippery or what have you. Or um, if, you know, heaven forbid, the brakes have an issue, you know, you don't have full braking authority. Um, so we did add margin to that as part of the as part of the, the routing algorithm. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess one thing to think about in a pilot's mentality, like, before you go fly, there has got to be pre-flight checks of this, right? Because like we said, it's a computer. I mean, I fly the G5000 and as you know, it's pretty much a flying computer now. And every time I turn on the batteries when it's cold, I might get a message and I turn it off and it comes back on and it works. But obviously there's going to be some kind of pre-flight checks to make sure that this works and doesn't work. Do you have have those already been created or is this going to be more of a, uh, the airplane manufacturer is going to create those pre-flight checks for it? The... Kind of both. Uh, so the system itself has pre-flight testing that's um, part of the autopilot pre-flight test. So the same way that on your aircraft, you know, it has like the um, white PFT message as it's doing the pre-flight. Uh, it does the same thing. It just checks those servos that are doing the brakes and auto throttle, that sort of thing. Um, and then wherever possible, the airframe manufacturers um, have added different messages and things to check, uh, to self-check their um, their portions. So Let's see, on the M600, there's a wheel speed sensor that, that helps quite a bit with um, touchdown detection and the anti-skid differential braking. Um, that wheel speed sensor obviously only gets used during during an auto land, but every time you have a, a takeoff, you can see that that wheel speed sensor is is spooling up. So they, um, they added a message that um, would check to see if your wheel speed sensor, whenever you're in takeoff mode, is, you know, is reading a valid value. Yeah. And what happens with the passenger in the plane? So this automatically kicks in. Or I know there is a button, but I mean, you mentioned a little bit how the plane, or I think I read an article where the plane might be able to detect when a pilot is incapacitated. Is there, what's the difference between those two? Yeah, so there's three ways that Autoland is activated. There's a couple other ways that we've thought of, but no one's implemented yet. The three main ways are um, a manual activation. So there's a button in the cockpit that the uh, passenger or pilot can uh, can select if they if they need to. Uh, that activates Autoland. The other two ways are using existing technologies that have been in the field for a while. One of them is level mode. So if you are flying with electronic stability and prote- protection, 
and you um, are flying uncoordinated for a significant period of time, it'll roll you into level mode and um, it'll obviously give you some enunciations that it's doing so. Um, obviously, if you don't want it to do so, you can always uh, use the AP button and turn that off. Um, but if you are in level mode for a significant portion of time and the pilot hasn't taken the uh, autopilot out of that, it'll warn you that it's going to activate auto land and go that direction. So that's kind of like a maybe the pilot is confused, disoriented, uh, maybe having you know a, a stroke or something. Who knows? Um, that's also I call it my sunscreen in the eyes. I've heard of pilots getting sunscreen in their eyes and having a similar thing happen. They're not you know, they're fine. They just have concern. Uh, and then the third way is using emergency descent mode. So um, that's been in the field for, I don't know, 20 years or so in various forms. And um, so if the pilot hasn't interacted with the system for a portion of time, it's kind of a timer is based off of altitude. So if your cabin altitude is um, really high, then it'll be pretty quick. Um, it can it'll start descending the aircraft to get you down to a lower altitude and some better oxygen. And uh, if at that point the pilot still hasn't woken up, then Autoland will uh, take over and get you to the airport. Yeah, we have uh, emergency descent mode in the Jedi Fly, and it's pretty crazy. We we did it once on the sim just to see when it would kick in and what it would do. And the only thing we need to do is just pull the spoiler, the speed brakes out, and it's going to do everything else on its own. So it's cool seeing how the technology was built and implemented and how you're able to use previous technology. Like it was all part of the system. Like it's all part of like the things are playing together and like the future is being mapped together and it all just kind of worked out and kind of all played well together and blended into what Autoland is. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's really cool. Um, let's see what I like how, I don't know. I was trying to think of like, how does it choose an airport? Like obviously is what's the, the number one priority? Is it the landing distance for the field? Is it proximity? Is it kind of the winds? Does it take into account if it's a tailwind, a crosswind, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So we have, um, several different criteria. There are some high criteria that are, um, hard limits as we call them. So, um, Landing distance and runway length is a hard limit. So if it's below a certain number, we just don't even consider it. Um, and then we have a bunch of um, different things. Oh, also with the hard limits, uh, GPS approaches. We do need to have a GPS approach with at least vertical guidance. Uh, so that's LPV, LP plus V, LNAV, VNAV, LNAV plus V, all those guys. Um, so we have those two that are required and then everything past that is based on um, a weight set. So if you have a, an airport that has, you know, a higher crosswind, but a longer runway compared to, you know, a longer, a shorter runway, but you know, no crosswind, uh, the system will weight those based off of the aircraft manufacturers uh, determined weights that they prefer for that aircraft. So if their plane handles crosswinds better then we can, um, we can scale that for them. There's different weights that we can use including um you know tailwind gradient of the air of the airport of the runway um width all sorts of things and does it take into account uh like minimums like weather minimums so say like you're flying over a really fogged an airport and it's at a quarter mile or it's at one sixteenth, and maybe you can't land there does it skip on to the next one uh so it does but not not for the reason you think it's uh it Consider the um, precipitation and um, visibility at the airport for passenger comfort. Uh, mostly, because they they don't like landing in you know pure white socked in zero zero. Yeah, exactly. But <laughs> yeah. the airport, technology it can land at zero zero. Um, no no problem. There's no um, weather requirement for auto land. What about fuel? So obviously, it's going to calculate the fuel you have. But say. Or, I mean, usually when this stuff happens, it's worst case scenario. Like, I never, like, it's always the worst time you can imagine. You're going to be flying over water. You're going to be doing all this kind of stuff. Does eventually, does the system eventually just say, all right, we are almost out of fuel. This is the best airport. We absolutely have to land here. Or will it kind of just keep flying until it finds the perfect runway? Uh, yeah. If we have any low fuel scenario, we just pick the closest. We just immediately go to wherever we can get to. Gotcha. And then has there ever been any, I mean, this would be kind of hard because obviously the closest airport would be without an LPV or without some kind of guidance, but like there absolutely has to be guidance, right? And there also won't be able to work. Exactly. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, so pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time it's going to be able to find a place to land. <laughs> so that's good. That's got to be comforting. It's better than not having a pilot. <laughs> right. And those, uh, those approaches are available all around the world, uh, even one in Antarctica. So, um, 
I'm, that's my favorite one when I would would do these global studies to see exactly where the airplanes would land and how they would land and which airports they'd pick and how they'd made that decision. The one in Antarctica was always my favorite to see exactly why I would choose that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Have you guys had any, are there any like dead spots? Cause you know, it relies on GPS a little bit, obviously. And there are times where there's GPS testing and there's other times of this. So they're like known dead spots or is it required for the pilot kind of to check notams to check GPS outages to, cause it might not work as well in those areas or maybe up in the higher terrain where GPS doesn't work as well or just all these figure. Are there certain areas in the world or in the country where it's not going to work as well or is it going to always work the best it can if it's, if it's up and running? Um, if it's, yeah, if you, if you can engage it. So if your autopilot's working, then it'll do what it can. Uh, but obviously in places that are like near the North Pole and South Pole, those places get kind of dicey with GPS in general, just because of um, the technology limitation. Um, there's also just places that don't have runways, you know, like the Saharan desert and yeah, like, there's just no people there. So there are airports. Um, so there are places like that where there's, um, maybe fewer airports, but there's always someplace nearby, especially if you have a little bit of fuel. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, definitely a little bit of fuel. What is the process for the passenger? So let's say they hit the button, the passenger's kind of freaking out. They, all they know is that they were trained to hit this big red button that says auto land. Can you talk me through what happens right when that button is hit for the passenger and maybe also kind of tie in how quickly the computer has already determined everything and it's ready to go and land? Yeah, so when they hit the button, um, first thing that they're going to hear is auto land activating. Uh, that, that comes over the speaker and the headset, so that it lets them know immediately that they, they did the thing that needs to happen. Um, and then the um, the um, MFD, so the middle screen, the multifunction display, that will start playing a video to them that tells them about um, what's happening, that auto land is, uh, has activated. It talks about how to use... Um, the touch controllers to talk to ATC. We turn the um, little touch screens in the aircraft into basically a, a walkie talkie, basically. So you can hit the button and talk with uh, ATC. We didn't want them to try to use the controls since they could accidentally hit the autopilot disconnect button. That'd be bad. Yep. Um, <laughs> so how to use that. Um, and about, you know, five seconds into this video, the, um, the, PFDs on both sides, so the primary flight displays, um, those will show where they're going to go. So that um, it, it'll have already changed over to kind of a passenger-centric view, but on the, along the bottom, it'll tell them which airport they're going to, and it's decoded. So it's not going to say, you know, KIXD. It's going to say New Century um, Air, Air Center. So it'll it'll tell the pilot, uh, the passenger, I suppose, exactly where they're going. And then the video continues with, um, you know, remain calm. If you want to speak, speak clearly, that sort of thing. Um, and then it shows on the maps all the different, the route it's going to take. Uh, if it needs to do a hold uh, to lose airspeed or altitude before it lands, it'll show um, show that hold for them with a standard magenta line. Uh, I think my favorite part of it, honestly, is on the map. Instead of an um, airport symbol that you're typically used to seeing in a sectional, we have the green airplane symbol, like what you'd see alongside of a highway. Um, so, you know, if a person's not as familiar with aviation, they'll still understand <laughs> airport. what they're seeing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I mean, you got to think of everything because you don't know the experience level that's in that cockpit. Like it could be someone taking up a kid for the first time and they could just be in the plane or from uh, it could be someone that's also a pilot as well. But maybe I don't, there's just so many scenarios that you have to think of when someone would push this button. And it sounds like you've all, you've tried. I mean, obviously, it's hard to hit every single button, but like you've obviously got all your ducks in a row and you're trying to figure out how you can make that person remain calm from not freaking out, grabbing the yoke, hitting the autopilot button. Cause like you said, once you hit that autopilot button, you got to turn it back on or else the plane's not going to be able to do what it's going to do. Right. And even if you do deactivate, we keep the um, middle display uh, showing a deactivation screen for a minute. So it'll show you how to reactivate it if there's an accidental deactivation. And then say, what about accidental activation? So maybe there's a kid in the background like, Oh cool. Pretty red button. Let me hit that. Boom. And then is it just as easy as hitting it again for the pilot to deactivate it? Uh, the pilot will deactivate using the autopilot disconnect button. So we wanted everything to stay with the same human factors as uh, standard uh, for a pilot. Like anything happens in the airplane that you don't like, you hit the AP disconnect and you just remove power from those servos and you get full control of the aircraft back. Um, so yeah, that, that's a, an easy, easy turn off switch. You have full control, but the process has already been started, correct? So is there any way to turn off the process of the auto land or is that always going to be on in the background? 
Uh, as soon as you hit that AP disconnect button, it'll turn off everything. Okay. Cool. And, yeah. That's good to know. So from the time of hitting auto land, from all, like you said, 900 landings, how long has it been for the plane to be in the air to go on the ground? Is there a kind of a standard time range? Um, from all of our simulations and our flight testing, I'd say it's typically based off of your altitude more than it is distance. Because there's almost always a, an airport somewhere below you that you, you can get into. Uh, but if you have to, you know, stay in a hold and bleed off 20,000 feet, then that's going to take a little bit of time just to hit VMO and not surpass aircraft limits. Um, but it's kind of funny because whenever we're doing our development flight testing, we know exactly what we're trying to test for. And our pilots have flown this so many times that they know exactly where they can hit the button to make it do exactly what they need it to. So their flights are typically like 11 minutes long because they know exactly where to, where to go. That's funny. Yeah. And in the situation, in the emergency situation, that's not going to be the case, right? (laughs) Yeah. That's uh, yeah, that's pretty funny. Uh, what has the general perception been and how has this been received? I know that there's very, very different thoughts about this. And I know some people might get pretty angry about this saying you're trying to take pilot jobs when really you're just using the technology to make aviation as safe as it possibly can be. Now in the future, yes, this might, this technology could lead to help uh, increase maybe the the push for single pilots or no pilots, but like this technology needs to be created and it to, to help with safety. And if you don't do it, someone else is going to do it. So how has this been received? What would you say? Has it been pretty well received by the mass gen or the mass public? Or do you think you've gotten a little bit of hate from it? Oh, I think it's been completely positive. I've seen a couple of funny, funny things people have said, but nothing, no, nothing you to take seriously. I think this, I want aliens, which was kind of fun. Um, like, I don't know what that's about. Um, I think just from my point of view, Garmin's trying to make aircraft safer. And I think you said it really well. Um, as a, I, I, I come from an aviation family. My grandfather was an airline pilot. My uncle was an airline pilot. My other uncle flies air cargo. One of my cousins is learning to fly. One of my other cousins is an airline Dang, pilot. No big deal. It's like royalty. <laughs> it, we, we, yeah, we, we like to talk about airplanes. Um, and all of them were very excited about it because I think every person that I, I know has lost someone who's lost a friend or family member or something to, you know, something horrible like this. And they're not that frequent. And I, I know that, but when they are, it's, it's very impactful. Yeah. All it takes is one. I mean, exactly. just, and a lot of people I talk to have all told me like, yeah, like I've lost a friend or I know someone's lost a friend. And if you're in aviation long enough, there's going to be a time where you will know someone that loses a friend, a loved one, or maybe you might have the friend that's lost. So it's definitely, this is, this is, this is a great technology. And I mean, I can only imagine that this is just the beginning of what you guys have planned for this. Like I'm guessing there is more to this than just this and you want mass use of this. Like I'm sure the goal would be to create it as small and make it as light as possible where all you really need is like an old Garmin 430. You know, I know that's probably not possible, but like a Garmin 430, 530, G1000 and any airplane and it will be able to do all of this. That's the dream. What? So what is the goal? So obviously it doesn't end here. Like I'm guessing you see this kind of as the beginning. What is kind of the the end all be all? What is maybe for for Garmin or for you with you are envisioning auto land and aviation and just commercial airlines, just everything. What's the end goal? Yeah, I think um, what I've heard uh, some of our leadership talk about is, you know, every airplane, you know, if we can get it into bigger airplanes, smaller airplanes, Passengers have a right to have a, a safety technology like this on the aircraft. Um, personally, my my dream is working towards the smaller aircraft, since that's um, a lot of times where you know you hear about you know someone had a heart attack or whatnot, and there's not that sec- second pilot that's in the aircraft to help out with that. Um, so that's that's kind of my personal place. Is I, I really enjoy the smaller aircraft that my friends and family would be flying for fun. Um, I think you'll see the technology go both directions. Yeah. Do you? So this will be a hard question to answer because, I mean, it's about time and obviously the technology needs to happen. But one, is the technology capable right now to put this in every aircraft without it being a significant expense? And two, if it's if it's a no for that, how long do you think it is before we have the ability to put that in every single airplane? I, I see it probably in the next 10 years or so that we're going to get to smaller aircraft. Um, that's completely a, just a guess based on... Uh, based on things, but the bigger aircraft, I think it's more of a regulation certification discussion, less so than a technology discussion. Um, so probably somewhere in there, somewhere in the next 10 years that we'll have something like this in a bigger aircraft. Um, for now that we're going to truck along with our, our G3000 customers and get those all on board and um, 
I think you're going to see some pretty fun announcements here in the next few years. Cool. Well, I'll look forward to it. And I guess another kind of part of this is what was, why Cirrus, why Piper, why those two airplanes? Was it kind of just like a, a marriage of new technology and new airplanes and kind of you guys all came together or did you actively seek planes or how did this work? Well, all of our OEM partners knew that we've been working on this for um, a good number of years. And so at the beginning of 2017, when we um, we mentioned um, to them that we, we think we're ready for some OEM participation and getting their aircraft uh, signed up, uh, Piper and Cirrus were the first two to jump on and say that this would be great for their uh, for their aircraft. So um, it was mostly a self-election. They, they chose that they wanted this on their aircraft and they made it a priority. Uh, I know Piper lent us an airplane for many years to get this uh, developed. So I uh, definitely appreciate the partnership between the OEMs and Garmin. Absolutely. And it was kind of funny because the first time I saw this wasn't with your post or wasn't with Piper's post, but it was Sirius's post. And I was like, okay, so is, Sirius, is this a Sirius thing? Is this a Garmin thing? Because when I first watched their promo video, they pretty much made it seem like this was like a Sirius technology and like Sirius is the reason for it. But the more I looked into it, I was like, oh, it's, just, it's a Garmin thing, not a Sirius thing. Yeah, I'm glad I'm an engineer. We get to just, you know, be proud of the airplanes out there and not have to worry about the marketing <laughs> Absolutely. The social media departments were like, whoa, 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 what the heck? <laughs> That's really funny. But yeah, I mean, the software is amazing. It is. I mean, obviously, there's going to be some people and some haters and stuff like that, but I think it's great. And it's only a matter of time, like you said, before we see it in every single plane. And it's going to it's it's needed. It's something that is needed. And maybe one day it's going to be a requirement because we are all about increasing safety in aviation. And general aviation has sometimes a good safety record. As of late, I feel like it's every week I'm reading new accident, new accident, new accident. Now, that might not always be due to pilot incapacitation. But I'm sure that is an issue. I'm sure that there are some pilot incapacitated. I can't talk. I'm sure there are pilots that have been incapacitated and this happened. So this is definitely needed. And I guess another question would be, what's kind of the next thing? How do you, is there a way do you think to program this even farther and say like you're in a twin engine plane, you lose an engine, you hit auto land and it figures everything out on that as well? Or do you, or like a hydraulic failure and the pilot just doesn't know what to do. Do you think that's in the future too? I can see, yeah, I can see that we can adapt the technology in different ways. Um, one of the things that I thought was really cool with this is um, we had to figure out our own barosync. You know, we had to figure out what that altimeter setting should be um, for the aircraft. So maybe things that we can help suggest, you know, hey, you're on short final and your gear aren't down. We're going to put those down unless you stop us. Or, um, hey, your baros setting is off by, you know, an inch. What are you doing? You know, and um, <laughs> those hey idiot yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of help guide, perhaps, with some of the things <laughs> that the aircraft learn how to do. We highly suggest you put the gear down. You're 50 feet above the ground. <laughs> Please. Yeah, that's really funny. I mean, oh, that, I think that's all good and safe things. that You might be able to implement that in other airplanes before you're actually able to implement auto land in all those airplanes, too. So in a way, you can still help out all of general aviation when auto land is specifically designed just for a small section right now. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's awesome. Well, hey, I mean, oh, one more question. How well, obviously the FA is a big part of this, and you talked about ATC. How has this been received with them? How have they been as partners in this, and have they had a big say in this, or are they kind of like, "Hey, we don't know what you're doing. Just do your thing. Let us know what's going on, and we'll uh, let you know if we like it or not." No, they were uh, they were involved from the very beginning. We had, um, I think, in 2015, we had our first meetings with them to discuss, um, you know, what they'd like to see, um, what they. Um, what they would recommend, you know, obviously they're the experts when it comes to, um, you know, pilot ops and um, how to interact with aircraft and how to interact with the national airspace. So we definitely got their opinions early on. Um, and as we're going through certification, there's obviously, you know, new opinions and things that we are trying to do our best to um, keep in mind and make sure we're being respectful of uh, the various groups. But they've been they've been really good partners. They've been great to work with. And honestly, my favorite people we've gotten to work with through this are um, the controllers around our um, our hangar and our airport. We have a we have a couple of hangars at uh, New Century Air Center in in Gardner, Kansas, and they've had to deal with the strangest requests from us as we've been testing this, and they've been <laughs> just champions. I yeah. love them. Deeply. That's really funny. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you don't really think about that. Like someone has to be the first controller to deal with this, and they're all of a sudden they hear like automated voice come on, and be like, "We are declaring an emergency." <laughs> And they're like what? Yeah, my favorite story is we had um, we were wanting to test the um, differential anti skid on the M six hundred, the braking system, and uh, we needed to test on ice and snow. And so we asked them to not plow the runway and not to plow the taxiways. 
And that's the opposite you normally hear from them. You know, normally it's like, when can you get this done faster? Yeah. Um, we need so a land. Yeah. They're a little confused with this. And we're like, can we please just leave it icy for a little bit? Yeah, please. Thank please you. <laughs> What was, uh, was there ever a time, like obviously something very monumental like this is going to take a lot of work and there's gonna be a lot of kind of bad news. You're gonna hit a lot of roadblocks. Was there ever a time where you just thought this was too much and maybe it wasn't going to actually happen? I don't think so. Um, Garmin's been a huge supporter of this. And obviously if you think about it, how many, you know, hundreds, thousands of flight hours we've put into it, not, you know, not even accounting for all the software and engineering time that we had to uh, to put into it. It was always, we're going to get there. Maybe it's not going to be today. Maybe it's not going to be tomorrow, but we're going to get there. That's awesome. That, I mean, it's good to have, to for someone to be able to create something like this and to possibly create a game-changing software, product, technology, you need great support from the top. So like Apple has great support from the top. They allow everyone to create what they need to create to create the best software. So it's just great to hear that there are companies like Garmin and there's other technology companies in aviation where they they kind of like, hey, this is what we want. Go do it. We're going to support you 100%. Like, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. So that's great to hear. Yeah, and Garmin's a great champion of pilots especially. We have pilot programs to uh, learn how to fly, get new ratings. Um, uh, Jessica Koss our ground, is our ground school instructor. Um, so Garmin has all these different programs that we um, that we're really proud of. We even have a an aircraft that um, if you work in a certain building, you get to go fly that one airplane. And we also have deals with all sorts of um, local areas so we can go rent airplanes. And it's just really great working I, at a company. That, so I need to come work for Garmin. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Garmin so, makes it really fun to fly. So more of the story, if you want to be a pilot and you want some help with it, go work for Garmin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, perfect. I appreciate you coming on. Is there anything that I haven't asked that maybe you want to talk about with Autoland or with Garmin, or do you think we've covered pretty much everything? Um, I just think it's really cool that Autoland is something that was developed in the, you know, in the heartland, uh, in the middle of, uh, Kansas, you know, and we've had a huge team of people over the years working on it. Um, so it's really great that it's, it's been announced and we can talk about it with our friends and family. You could have talked, was there a huge non-disclosure agreement where you're getting fired if you even mentioned it to anyone? No. Um, so Garmin obviously has an NDA for uh, our employees just as a standard precaution, yeah. but, um, Autoland, we all knew it was such a game changer that it was it was very dear to us, you know, and that was never even needed to be discussed. It's just something that we all wanted to work towards. That's awesome. Well, that's really cool. I, I appreciate you coming on and I appreciate you kind of telling the story of Autoland and Garmin and just thank you for your work. I'm sure this was a lot of work and now we're able to celebrate this and we're able to see it come into the aviation world. And I can't wait to see where it's going to go. And hopefully in five years or maybe less than that, I can have you back on talking about some more cool stuff that Garmin's doing. So Bailey, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. That is a wrap of episode 88 of the Pilot the Pilot podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can check out our website, pilotthepilothq.com. And if you have any feedback or you want to be on the show, or even better, you know someone that should be on the show, email me, pilotthepilothq at gmail.com. Avian Nation, that's all I have for you today. And I look forward to seeing you next week. And as always, happy flying.